So uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to this briefing for media on blue hydrogen, the technical challenges and weak commercial prospects of this uh, technology. And I'd just like to make a brief introduction to our two presenters. Uh, we have David Schlissel, who is Director of Resource Planning Analysis at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Uh, David has been a regulatory attorney and consultant on energy and utility issues since 1974. He has testified as an expert witness before regulatory commissions in more than 35 states and before the U.S. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. He has consulted for utilities, state governments, and attorneys general, consumer advocates, city governments, and national and local environmental organizations. Um, he has an engin engineering degree from MIT and Stanford University, as well as a Juris Doctor from Stanford Law. And the other presenter is Suzanne Maté. Suzanne is, AIFA um, is, sorry, she's an energy policy analyst at AIFA, and she has produced several reports on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission pipeline projects, as well as conducting research on petrochemical projects, gas flaring, and fossil fuel extraction on public lands. She served as regional director for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and was on the, um, she was a senior environmental advisor to the New York State Comptroller and worked at the New York State uh, Department of Environmental, I, I think I, I got that wrong, but it's uh, the New York State Department for Environmental Protection. Um, so, and I should add that Suzanne is also an attorney she gra and a graduate from Yale Law School and is a consultant with Lookout Hill Public Policy Associates. And she has over 30 years of experience in environmental and administrative law and policy. So without further ado, uh, this presentation will last around 30 minutes and there will be time for questions at the end. So do use the Q&A tab to uh, input your questions and we'll have time at the end uh, for those. So thank you very much and um, please begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Vivian. We've conducted quite a bit of research on blue hydrogen, and our analysis starts from the basic fact that blue hydrogen projects are fossil fuel projects. They use methane, which is the primary component of natural gas. Natural gas is typically 77% methane, and they they are uh, being promoted as a clean technology because they claim that they will capture the carbon, the carbon capture and storage process called CCS. What we have found that is that commercial CCS projects have never achieved the industry target rate over time. And this is despite years of effort. Carbon capture has been around for many, many years. And the government has sunk a lot of money into its development and other companies have sunk money into it and it just hasn't gotten where it needs to go. So um, we're gonna discuss what the situation is, the real world record of carbon capture. And we'll also discuss why we've concluded that blue hydrogen has very weak economic prospects, that it, it is not a good tool for state economic development. The markets will not be robust. The important thing to understand about the, the Zoom work call. Excuse me. The, the important thing to understand about the energy transition is that the markets are a positive force. Renewables are accelerating. Fossil fuels are becoming less and less attractive to investors. But the energy transition change is not, it needs to happen faster than the market forces would make it happen. So federal incentives can help and states need to lead the way to expedite transition. The Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act contains incentives, but that's all they are. The projects are going to look to the states 
and the states will be the laboratories for change. Now, states have economic development tools, but they're always limited, and they need to focus on job generating businesses with real staying power. What they want to avoid, what they should avoid, are businesses that require, uh, in effect, a perpetual life support system of government subsidy to keep them going. From our perspective, blue hydrogen is very likely to fall into that category. So when states are deciding whether they want to participate in the federal incentives program for hydrogen development and other incentives programs, they, they need to ask, what's the real world experience? There are a lot of pro promises out there, but what's the real world experience in sustained, efficient rates which achieved on targeted emissions over time, over a year, over several years? What on-site emissions are escaping the carbon capture equipment and what is the what about the upstream and downstream emissions and risks and finally what about the complete system cost for blue hydrogen because it is extensive it involves the drilling the transport which all get uh, folded into the cost of the natural gas. It involves the removal system, but also when the carbon dioxide gas is captured, um, the emissions, the, the, um, the gas needs to be compressed. It needs to be transported to wherever it's going to go, either for end use or for storage. These are all costs that need to be considered. And the states need to know, are, are they the only game in town? Um, is this project going to be attractive to other investors? And does it have a robust market future? So I'm going to turn it over to David to talk about the, uh, the reality check of carbon capture and the costs. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Suzanne has shown that blue hydrogen is a fossil fuel because the source is methane uh, in natural gas. Uh, thus capturing the CO2 that is produced for natural gas is converted into hydrogen. Hydrogen is an essential feature of blue hydrogen projects. Now capturing 90% or more of the CO2 produced at a project is the holy grail for CCS. Proponents of blue hydrogen will say outright or more likely suggest or imply that 90% ca carbon capture has been proven or demonstrated at existing projects, but this is not true. No commercial scale project has captured 90% or more of the CO2 produced at a project over the medium or long term, by which I mean years and decades, which they will have to do if CCS will be an effective tool for, for reducing CO2 emissions and concentrations. Achieving this goal sporadically clearly is not enough. Thus, blue hydrogen combines the worst of two worlds. It uses fossil fuels and an unproven carbon capture technology. What could possibly go wrong? Next slide, please. Uh, in order to uh, make blue hydrogen as clean as green hydrogen, it would have to capture all of the CO2 emitted by hydrogen during uh, the hydrogen production process. It would have to, to capture all of the CO2 emitted by any on-site or even off-site power sources used to drive the uh, hydrogen production equipment and carbon capture equipment. Uh, there would have to be no emissions uh, from the upstream methane extraction, processing, and transportation uh, to the plant. And there would have to be no downstream CO2 leakage from uh, transportation and storage. They, thus they have to go, it's far different than green hydrogen. Next slide, please. Uh, the real world 
uh, experience with CO2 capture is far below what the uh, what is the uh, promised by blue hydrogen proponents. For example, these are four projects, two in the US, two in Canada. Uh, the first two on the left are hydrogen production process. Uh, the furthermost left uh, is the Quest project in, in Alberta, owned by Shell Oil. You can see that if you just look at the uh, hydrogen production process, uh, Quest captured at most 83% of the CO2. Uh, if you include uh, other aspects of uh, the Quest project, including the operation of the carbon capture and sequest, duration equipment, the amount of CO2 captured drops to 68%. Uh, the next uh, project is the air products uh, plant in uh, Texas. It's captured uh, less than 50% of the CO2 produced uh, just from the hydrogen production process. If you include uh, the on-site uh, a CO2 capture, it's only captured 40% of the total CO2. Uh, the last two projects are coal plants, uh, Petronova, uh, which is now closed, uh, captured at most 70% of the CO2 from flu, from flu gas, excuse me, uh, and uh, Boundary Dam uh, Unit 3 in Saskatchewan, which is still operating. It's the only commercial sized power plant in the world that is capturing uh, CO2, uh, only is captured uh, by our analysis, barely more than half of the CO2 it produces. And the CO2 it captures is used for enhanced oil recovery, which produces more oil that's then creates additional CO2 emissions when that additional oil is burned or used as a uh, petrochemical feedstock. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now there have been major commercial scale CCS uh, failures. Uh, the DO, US Department of Energy has funded part of the costs of 11 CCS demonstration projects, only three of which were completed. The other eight were either withdrawn or terminated. Uh, the DOE has spent a, more than a billion dollars on these uh, projects. Uh, I'm gonna talk about two of them. Uh, the Kemper project, uh, owned by the Southern Company in Mississippi. It was designed to gasify lignite. Lignite is a uh, low-grade coal, basically uh, a little bit above mud. Uh, the uh, gasified lignite, would. the plan was to capture the CO2 prior to the combustion of this gasified uh, lignite. Uh, however, the project had significant problems because the gasification process could not be made to uh, work reliably. Therefore, the gasification and the carbon capture pieces of the project uh, were, can were not canceled. They were not used uh, starting in 2017 and were demolished in 2021. Uh, the cost of the project was initially uh, projected at $3 billion and it ballooned up to $7.5 billion. Uh, it's probably the world's most expensive natural gas fired power plant now. Uh, Edwards Port uh, had a similar design to uh, Kemper. It's a project in, built by Duke Energy in Indiana. Uh, the project uh, Cost jumped from two billion to more than three point five billion. Uh, originally, it was promoted as a carbon capture facility, but that was dropped when it was a study by the owner Duke 
found that the costs of capturing carbon would be extremely high. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Uh, the two existing commercial scale hydrogen projects uh, that capture more than uh, 1 million metric tons per year were two thirds funded by governments. Uh, the air products plant in Port Arthur, Texas, I mentioned before, uh, received funding from the US Department of Energy. Uh, the owner of the plant only provided a third of the funding. Uh, the Quest project in Alberta, Canada uh, received uh, so almost 600 million, almost 700 million of its total billion dollar cost from the Alberta and Canadian federal government, uh, roughly 64%. Uh, next slide, please. So carbon capture is costly and expensive, uh, but achieving the high capture rates that are being claimed by proponents of blue hydrogen will be even more expensive. Uh, the US DOE estimates, as you can see from this slide, that the cost of capturing CO2 from coal plants has been uh, somewhere in the range of 60 to 65 per metric ton. Uh, but as we've seen, uh, the capture rates from coal plants have been very low, 55, 53% for uh, Boundary Dam in Canada, uh, at most 70% for Petronova. Uh, Shell Oil, the owner of Quest, reported, has reported that the cost of capturing CO2 have averaged just slightly under $64 a ton uh, for capture rates that uh, I think it most it was one year was 83%. Uh, analysis in a study by uh, published in a, a journal, <coughs> Applied Energy, uh, found even higher rates, uh, higher costs for higher uh, capture rates. Now, CCS proponents acknowledge that this cost must be reduced by about 50% by 2030 for CCS to be financially viable but they have a long way to go. Next slide, please. Now, some proponents of blue hydrogen and, and CCS will claim that the cost of capturing CO2 already are declining, but there's no evidence to support this claim. Only the estimates of the future costs of capturing CO2 of plants that have not yet been built have declined. So there's no actual experience. Now, I should have mentioned before, but there's no current experience with capturing CO2 from natural gas fired plants be and is expected to be more energy intensive and more expensive because the CO2 concentration in the flue gas from natural gas fired plants is much lower than that from coal plants. Note that I've been talking about capture costs so far. They do not include the costs for compressing, transporting, injecting, and monitoring geologically stored CO2, which have been estimated to add another 20 to $25 per ton to the total cost of capture and storage. But that's only an estimate. So if you put that together with a current cost of $60 a metric ton, or $60, $60 a ton, excuse me, you're talking about a total cost of $85 a ton uh, even if these estimates are correct, and that's expensive, very expensive, because it goes on top of what's it going to cost to generate power at the uh, the power the power plant uh, that is providing the energy to drive the hydrogen production process. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are other cost concerns for states to consider when reviewing natural gas-based hydrogen projects, blue hydrogen projects. Uh, as I've mentioned, the, site, the cost of siting and constructing new pipelines and compression stations for the natural gas that will come in as a source fuel and the hydrogen and CO2 that will be uh, produced at the plant. 
Uh, both of, all of those will add costs and time and perhaps have significant environmental impacts. Natural gas prices are volatile, especially these days. Higher natural gas costs will mean um, the whole process will be much more expensive uh, than, than I've shown. And then oversight costs. States and the federal government will have to spend more for staffing to permit and monitor how well projects are operating. And there are likely to be more violation proceedings uh, in time. Next slide. And I'll turn it back to Suzanne. Thank you. So we mentioned at the beginning that blue hydrogen projects are fossil fuel projects. And the, the upstream emissions aspect of blue hydrogen projects is both an environmental problem and a cost problem. Uh, the, the blue hydrogen projects are of limited value to investors who are looking to up their green credentials because of the fact that they're pulling this fuel out of the ground, sending it through pipelines, and the leakage problems are significant and ramped up, really. And in the face of criticisms on proponents have asserted that they're going to use responsibly sourced gas, natural gas. And the really a major theme of our report is that you have to look at the real world experience. The real world experience is that EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency has been trying to control methane from drilling and pipeline transport for a long time. They made two major regulatory attempts in 2012 and 2016, but they were basically ineffective. The emissions declined by about 0.3% from 1990 through 2019. Now they're trying again. They have a whole new regulatory process, a gazillion comments. Who knows when they're going to be done writing those regulations? Uh, who knows how many lawsuits might be filed when, the, when these regulations are promulgated? But if and when they are, there will have to be more controls placed to, uh, to limit the leakage of methane. And that will increase the cost of, of the methane supply. So. It's both an environmental issue and an economic issue. Then I would go on to talk about uh, blue hydrogen as a, what is its future? What is its future? Blue hydrogen's market prospects don't look good. It's got baggage and it's lagging behind. The, uh, the technology is costly and it's complex. Lots of opportunities for things to go wrong. Uh, government investment, you know, it worked for solar. Uh, the Department of Energy had a marvelous project that uh, was designed to cut solar energy costs by about 75% in 10 years. They made it in seven. Another project to try and boost carbon capture was, was a fiasco. Most of the projects did not, did not even come to fruition. It was, there were, I think there were only three projects that survived the process and, and it just was not a success. So you'll see that, that over time, you know, not every invention works, not every, not every invention makes it into the mainstream. And blue hydrogen has been trying to get into the mainstream for a long time. It's just not happening. To get a little more specific about this, uh, if you look at the markets that blue hydrogen is targeting, they want to get into power generation. So we can go to the next slide. They're way behind. Um, solar power is expected to account for 46%. When you add wind, it gets up to 63% of the utility scale power generation capacity installed this year, 2022. That's already now, they're already, those two are already making up about two thirds of the new generation capacity. For peak demand, the, you know, the periods when you have extreme cold or extreme heat and you need extra energy 
or there's some intermittency problem, battery storage advances are very likely to eclipse blue hydrogen for that purpose. Another area that they've talked about targeting is home and commercial heat. They're just way behind the curve. Um, electrification is already advancing for home and building heat when you combine the electric electrification with technologies like heat pumps, you can really target, um, really target energy efficiency. And it just doesn't have the technological problems and issues that hydrogen has, you know, the, the, the problem of corrosion, the problem of volume. Hydrogen is not as, not as energy dense as natural gas. So that if you, if you have a 20% blend of hydrogen and natural gas, the power blend is really only about 7%. So you, you've got a volume issue there. Transportation is, uh, hydrogen is way behind. Electric vehicles are very likely to eclipse hydrogen, not only for cars and small trucks, but they're even getting into the big truck market. It's, it's going to live, leave only very limited transportation markets. And a lot of this was already identified by the US Geological Survey, which is my favorite federal agency because they just don't seem to be as affected by politics as other agencies. And they, they took a look at the hydrogen market in 2020 and basically determined that most of the market they're targeting is already serviced by other energy sources and that the renewable sources of solar, wind, and geothermal were likely to take up, take up the slack and fill that niche. And maybe they would be able to, you know, double their existing market, but not likely because these other, these other um, technologies are out there and they're just charging ahead. So you may see continued interest in hydrogen for fertilizer makers that work with the ammonia that you can produce with hydrogen, maybe with certain manufacturers that need high temperature heat. But even in that situation, the green hydrogen is not, green hydrogen is going to be more attractive than blue. Green is made from water with renewable energies. It's going to be much more attractive for companies that want to improve their green credentials. It's gonna be more popular with consumers. And um, the, the price of electroly electrolyzers to produce green hydrogen had just been plummeting. I mean, it fell about 40% from 2015 to 2019. And it's projected to drop another 20 to 39% uh, by 2030. And there are companies in other countries uh, that are talking about cutting, cutting the cost of, of um, green hydrogen substantially. They're just, we're going to see it become much more competitive than blue in a very short period. Blue hydrogen projects take time to build. By the time they build and they're up and running, they're gonna be facing a very, very different market. So is blue hydrogen a good driver of jobs? Is it good for the, for, for the economy? If I were a state, I would not be putting my money in blue hydrogen because even if a facility gets built, the market is going to continue to get chewed up by the cleaner, greener, and cheaper alternatives, the less troublesome alternatives. So they're likely to see declining production over time, likely to see job layoffs, diminishing employment trajectory. You may see some stranded assets. It doesn't, it doesn't look to us as though it has a good future. That's, that's the bottom line. And investors are seeing the problem. So I'm gonna turn it back to David. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, basically, investors are wary of putting their own money into carbon capture projects. Uh, that's why project developers want federal and state governments, uh, that's you and me as taxpayers, to bear the risk that projects either will not succeed or if they succeed will be much more expensive than proponents are now claiming. 
Uh, these are three examples of where uh, proponents of uh, carbon capture have acknowledged the risk uh, associated with, with those projects. Next slide, please. Uh, here's where some uh, CEOs of uh, get the same message about the risks associated with carbon capture. Uh, many have uh, explained that it's not economically viable or the technology is not mature enough to rely on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Contrary to the uh, hesitancy of private investors to put their money into uh, CC, their own money into CCS projects, they're heavily engaged in green energy projects. You can see the numbers here in dollars and uh, uh, euros, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars will end up being put into it. Uh, Let's go a couple of slides. Let's go to slide uh, 43, please. The bottom line for states and federal decision-making has to be a transparent process that relies on actual data on CCS effectiveness, what emissions on during the hydrogen production and carbon capture processes will es escape capture? What are the upstream emissions and what are the risks of downstream uh, leaks? And there has to be act transparent cost data. It's unlike what the industry has done today. I mean, basically, we've been able to find actual data on one project out of the 24 to 26 that are currently operating in the world. Uh, currently, project owners don't report their capture rates. They'll just say we captured a million tons of CO2. Now, that's great if the plant produces a million fifty uh thousand tons of CO2, but it's not so hot if the plant produces 10 million tons of CO2 and only captures one. So state and federal decisions have to be based, as it says here on slide 43, robust, accurate data, comprehensive economic and environmental assessments, and vigorous analysis of the long-term market for blue hydrogen, and the job impacts in light of the competition that Suzanne just laid out. Next slide, please. So the question of the day, does blue hydrogen belong on the list of effective clean energy options? The answer is a big no. And the last slide, slide 45, has uh, links to five uh, memos that we've also produced in support of what Suzanne and I have presented today. And I guess we're ready for questions. Great. Um, I don't know if everyone can hear me. Uh, I did put some questions in the chat window for the panelists. Uh, the first one is from John Funk. He asks whether we're going to um, talk about the Department of Energy funding of blue hydrogen pro projects to the tune of $8 billion. Can you speak to that? Uh, well, I would just say you can't talk about building hubs before you talk about what are going to be the blue hydrogen projects that connect to the hubs. The government is, looks like, seems like it's putting the uh, horse before the cart. They have to show the tech. First, it has to be shown the technology works, and second, that it's economic. Instead of doing that, the federal government has said, "Oh, we're we're open for business. We'll give out eight billion dollars to states." Of course, so all the states are going to run for the money, and a lot of grifters who are involved in hydrogen production, the oil and gas industry, carbon capture and sequestration, they're going to go, "Whoa, we want some of the money too." But it's backwards. First, they got to show the technology is technically and economically viable. 
I would add to that, that um, the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act requires the hydrogen to be clean. And that means if gray hydrogen, which is hyd hydrogen made from natural gas, but without carbon capture, um, is producing uh, nine kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of hydrogen, the definition of clean hydrogen would bring that down to two kilograms of carbon dioxide per kilogram of hydrogen. But if you look at the record of carbon capture and you look at the emissions that are not even being funneled into the carbon capture system, it's just hard to imagine how they can even get to that goal. So there is a little bit of wiggle room in the federal statute. They do say we want all we want one blue, one green, one pink, which is nuclear. Uh, nuclear electrolysis of water, uh, but they say they have language to the effect of um, to the extent practicable. And I think that if they took a really close look at what's going on here, they would see that blue hydrogen is really not practicable, that it can't guarantee that it's going to be clean. So there may be some room to move. Great. Um, the other question is uh, from Matthew Bravanti at Bloomberg Neff. He was talking about the numbers in slide 18, and he's wondering if we have citations for this work or how we arrived at those percentages. Uh, we have uh, looked at, well, it, de it, it depends on which project you're talking about. Uh, for Quest, they file annual, uh, Shell files annual reports with the government of Alberta that has detailed uh, data in it. Uh, so some of the numbers are taking, taken directly from that uh, report. Some are based on our analysis of adding in the CC, adding two, two numbers from, from there. Uh, for the others, uh, We've been spending a lot of time looking at the Petronova and Boundary Dam. Uh, we have a lot of data. We're happy to, uh, if you email me at D Schlissel, you can see my how my first name is spelled at the first slide at IEFA.org. Uh, I'll set up a time for my colleague, uh, Dennis uh, Wamstead and, and, and I to, uh, talk you through the data but we yes we have citations go to the IEFA website we've written four or five uh analyses of uh carbon capture or, and, or the weaknesses in carbon capture and let me add that this the powerpoint is supported by a, a series of uh technical memos or supporting documents, which I think the links are at the end of this PowerPoint. And Great one topic. of them is the reality check memo that gives all of the sources for all of the numbers in that particular slide. But we're happy to talk with you, we love footnotes. Matthew, or anyone else about how we develop these numbers. We're, we're confident in them. Right. Great. The so air there's product a, was done partly through a freedom of information request also, because both, both air products and Quest had government money. And so that meant it was easier to get information on them. It's harder to get information about private sector projects, but they all needed federal money. So we were able to more easily get data. Great, so we have a question from Kevin Robinson Avila. He said, Suzanne, you said that there was a 40% decline in electrolyzer prices from 2015 to 2019. Right. Um, and he missed the projected further decline through 2030. Can you just repeat that? Sure, it's 20% to 39%. Great, and then we have a question from Matthew Mihalik. He says, what are the risks of captured CO2 leaking out from underground storage areas? What is the track record for long-term capture? 
Uh, I'm not aware, uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that yes, there's a, re, a risk of CO, captured CO2 leaking out from underground storage areas. Uh, I'm not an expert on how much is leaked out today. I know that there have been some leaks in, in CO2 pipelines, uh, but I have to admit that I can't give you a, a tonnage. What I can say is that most of the CO2 captured to date has been used for enhanced oil recovery, not permanent uh, underground storage. Uh, and as I mentioned during my presentation, uh, using captured CO2 for EOR means more oil is produced, more oil is burned or used as a uh, petrochemical feedstock and therefore more CO2 is produced from using captured CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, the analyses are either, our analysis is that maybe if you include uh, EOR uh, produced CO2 that maybe using the captured CO2 for EOR saves a little bit in overall CO2 leakage. Other analyses that I trust by, by others uh, show that it's a net neg it's a net positive in terms of it produces more CO2 than you capture. I hope that's clear. The Department of Energy is looking at the question of whether seismic disturbances uh, can cause problems for carbon storage. There's a, a new study that they launched about a $4 billion study. So that's just a question we don't know the answer to. Okay, we have one more question from John Funk. Have you looked at the inefficiency of green hydrogen production, either with high temperature or ambient temperature electrolysis? Uh, I've not, John. No, and I have not either. There's a lot of interest in it. There's a lot of investment in it, but we haven't analyzed the technology. We can only say that it's it's generally been discussed as being as as becoming more and more competitive. Great. All right, I, th I think that's all the questions that we have in the chat window. Um, if, if there are any more questions, please type it into the chat window or the Q&A. Um, and otherwise, we, you, you do have on our website, we have this PowerPoint plus all the reference materials and memos that went along with it. So you can actually see where all of the numbers come from. And as David and Suzanne have mentioned, there are very open to receiving your questions and you know please let us know if you have any follow up there is another question from on the the q and a the chat from matthew provant what is that i'm not seeing that i'll read it okay. another channel is scaled to replace you as hydrogen consumption with green would require 60 plus GW. How reasonable is this? Well, the quest, I mean, gigawatts GW of electrolyzers. electrolyzers. Uh, I think you've got to replace it. Well, you're either going to replace it with hydrogen product, blue hydrogen production and capture of CO2. Uh, or electric height, excuse me, uh, elect green electrolyzers. Yeah, I, I'd have to look at your numbers, Matthew. Happy to talk to you offline about it, but I'd have to look at your numbers to, 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 to see the figures. Uh, there's a lot of development in the area. There's a lot of uh, proposals for green energy projects, wind, solar, battery storage. 
uh, the transition's underway and it's uh, gonna proceed at an accelerating rate, we believe. But let's talk offline. Okay. I think that's all the questions for now. Uh, if anybody has any other follow-up, please let us know. And, uh, you know, to be continued. This is a subject that we will be following closely over the upcoming months. And we look forward to receiving your questions. So thanks everybody and have a great day.